All right, welcome to this video on dimensional analysis. In this lecture, we're going to talk about modeling and similarity um, using dimensional analysis. So in a previous lecture, we talked about using dimensional analysis to simplify experiments. We talked about dimensional analysis to uh, present data in a more compact form. But we, did, we didn't talk about using dimensional analysis to do scale modeling. So for example, when we test new aircraft designs, we do it in a wind tunnel using a scale model rather than going out and building you know, full-scale prototypes and testing them in real life. That would be ridiculous because it would be too expensive and dangerous and such. So, so in this lecture, we'll talk about doing that scale modeling. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the screen here. The picture you have on the screen is of, uh, comes from a Godzilla movie, an older Godzilla movie. And they used a lot of scale modeling, obviously, in the Godzilla movies. They didn't really build a 100-foot tall di uh, monster. And um, when they did this scale modeling, they did a, a pretty good job of what we call geometric similarity. Geometric similarity means that all of the uh, length dimensions are scaled in the same way. So if you had, for example, a 100-foot tall Godzilla and a 10-foot tall uh, structure that he was going to stomp on, and you wanted to actually scale that down, uh, and you made it, a, uh, let's just make it easy, a 10-foot tall Godzilla, you'd have to make the structure 1-foot tall. So you keep the, the scaling 10 to 1, both at the large scale and the small scale. That's called geometric similarity, just keeping all this, the length ratios the same between the full scale and the, the model scale. By the way, we call the full scale the prototype. Okay, That's just the terminology that's used. When, so when you hear someone say, oh, the prototype, they mean the full scale. And the model could be either smaller or bigger. Okay. So in the Godzilla movies, they did a great job with geometric similarity, building scale models. Uh, but there's another kind of similarity that we need to take into account, and that's called dynamic similarity. Dynamic similarity is when all the force ratios are the same between the prototype and the model. And what I mean by a, a force ratio, it, it'll be a lot clearer in, a, in, a diff in the next lecture, but a force ratio is like a characteristic a ratio of characteristic forces. So for example, you may already be familiar with a Reynolds number. Reynolds number is a characteristic inertial force to a characteristic viscous force. Um, so an inertial force is just kind of like, like mass times acceleration. It's just how it's related to the, the, the acceleration of little bits of fluid. And a characteristic viscous force would be related to the viscous stresses acting on the piece of fluid. So the ratio of those two kind of forces is called the Reynolds number. It's just a force ratio. So getting those force ratios the same, and by the way, again, we call that dynamic similarities when all the force ratios are the same between the prototype and the model. But in the Godzilla movies, they don't quite get that dynamic similarity correct in all instances. And so it looks a little bit off. So for example, when Godzilla steps on a building and it explodes and a, a fireball goes up in the air, the movement of that fireball looks a little off, and it's because they're, they're likely not getting the a characteristic buoyant force because of the heated air as the explosion goes off and so the, the plume of air goes upward, they're probably not getting that buoyant force to inertial or viscous forces quite right, that, that ratio correct from prototype to model. So it looks a little off. And if you look at these movies um, from the old Godzilla movies, you'll see that. They don't quite look right. And in fact, the link I give here, there's a YouTube link to this Blue Oyster Cult song called Godzilla. They show a lot of old clips from the Godzilla movies, and you can kind of see it. It's fun to watch. When we have face-to-face -face lectures, I often show that video um, so you can sort of see how it looks just a little off, even though the geometric similarity is correct. Besides, it's a pretty good song. Uh, Blue Oyster Cult was a good band back in the day, and uh, so it's worth listening to anyway. So I encourage you to listen to that one. Another neat thing uh, related to Godzilla is this paper, Godzilla versus the Scaling Laws of Physics. I encourage you to take a look at that. It's not a hard paper to understand, but uh, this this author goes through and talks about different, um, you know, pretends that if Godzilla was real, um, what's so unusual about Godzilla in the way, you know, because it's such a you know huge monster, um, you know, things don't quite scale properly compared to real animals uh, on Earth, and so he talks about some of the scaling associated with that. It's it's a neat paper. It's worth checking out. It's very easy read in terms of technical content. So you might want to take a look at that. So let's go ahead and get into the material for today. Uh, we're going to start with something pretty basic. Let's take a look at this top equation here. Y is a function of some x variables. Now, 
it's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, if I told you like if I gave you the value for x1 and x2 and let, let's just say the, these two values. If I give you the, the same numbers on the right hand side of the equation, you should always expect to get the same value on the left hand side, right? If I give you x1 and x2 and you calculate y and then I give you the same value for x1 and x2, you're going to still get the same value of y, right? Totally makes sense. Same thing holds true even if it's in dimensionless form, like in the second equation. It's just now we, we've rewritten the equation in terms of dimensionless variables, the pi terms. So if I gave you the same pi 2 and the same pi 3, you would expect to always get the same pi 1, right? It just totally makes sense that it's the same function, you'll always get the same results. Now the thing to keep in mind is that the pi terms are typically written in terms of ratios of quantities, right? So for example, in the previous lecture, we um, had a pi term that looked like this. Let me write this out. Uh, okay, just messing around with my marker here. So remember we had this pi term that looked like uh, this one where we had a, an initial velocity, y dot naught, over the square root of gravitational acceleration times an initial position. This comes from the ballistic equation example in the previous video. That's a dimensionless quantity or a pi term. Now, if that, let's pretend for a moment that that's pi 2 up here, right? So again, um, if I give you the same value for pi 2 and pi 3, I'll get the same pi 1 value, right? But I could form, I could get the same pi 2 value from this ratio, but fiddle around with these parameters here so that, you know, some are larger and some are smaller, but I still get the same pi 2 value, right? For example, if I made gravity half as big, so if I used a 1 half g but increased the initial, initial position by a factor of 2, then the 1 half and the 2 would cancel each other out and I'd still end up with the same value, right? That makes sense. Let me just kind of write that down here. If I did this, That's exactly, this will give me the same value as this. So I could decrease gravity by half, but increase the initial position by a factor of two, but end up with the same pi term. And then if it's the same pi term, I'll still get the same pi one term. This is what modeling is all about, is what we'll do is we'll, we'll keep the pi terms the same, whether we're dealing with the prototype or the model, and then we'll get the same pi term on the left-hand side. So what I mean by that is this. So if I make pi 2 for the model equal to pi 2 for the prototype, so if I, if I keep the pi terms in the model the same value as the pi terms in our full scale prototype, so on the right hand side of the equation, so pi 3 model same as pi 3 prototype, if I keep those the same, then I will automatically get that the pi 1 in the model should equal to pi 1 in the prototype. Okay, so when we're going to do scale modeling, the key thing to keep in mind is we need to keep the dimensionless terms the same between the prototype and the model. If we do that and we have the same physics, meaning the same function, when I say the same function, I mean this F2 on the screen, as long as I have the same physics, the same function, I will get the same output from the, the relationship here. Okay, and we'll go through an example and you'll see how this is done. But if we can do that, then we can do scale modeling. So the key is to keep the pi terms the same. When we keep all the pi terms the same, that's known as full similarity. So we, we have some terms for this. So let's call, uh, so we've already talked about geometric similarity. Geometric similarity just means keeping all the length ratios the same. Okay, so any pi term that involves just purely lengths, keeping those pi terms constant between the model and the prototype, that's called maintaining geometric similarity. This is what people think of of, of scale modeling. They just make a, you know, when you buy a, a model plane, for example, you're building a model that has geometric similarity with the real plane. Just all the length ratios have been shrunk down. I also mentioned dynamic similarity. Dynamic similarity is when the force ratios between the real life 
uh, situation and the model are the same. So I talked a bit about the Reynolds number. Reynolds number is a ratio of a characteristic inertial force to a characteristic viscous force. If we can keep the Reynolds number the same between the prototype and the model, then that means we're getting those force ratios the same between them. Okay, and that's a type of dynamic similarity. So dynamic similarity involves just all the pi terms involving ratios of forces. The last one is what we call kinematic similarity. Kinematic similarity involves just velocity kinds of ratios. So just the, the way the material moves. It's like having, if, if, it's like if you had kinematic similarity between the prototype and the model, it means all the streamlines, streak lines, and path lines look the same. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference if you just looked at streamlines because they would look exactly the same between the prototype and the model. Just, just one is smaller and one's bigger. Uh, normally we don't have you know, control over kinematic similarity. It's, it's the velocities, you know, it's, it's kind of like, um, like when we solved the Navier-Stokes equations, what we were trying to do is solve for the velocities, right? So kinematic similarity kind of comes out of what we do. What we usually have control over is geometric similarity as well as um, dynamic similarity. So it turns out that if you have these two, geometric and dynamic similarity, then you automatically will get kinematic similarity. And if you get all of the pi terms the same, and then it's called full similarity. So full similarity just means that we have all of, we have geometric, dynamic, and kinematic similarity. They're all, it's all taken care of. Um, all the pi terms are the same, okay? And again, just if you have geometric and dynamic similarity, you automatically get kinematic similarity, or you know, you, you get full similarity. It's just some terminology. So you'll hear people talk about, oh, you know, we need to maintain dynamic similarity. Just that just means that you're dealing with the force ratios. Okay. All right. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at an example. I just want to make sure I haven't missed anything I wanted to say here. Nope. Okay, so what I want to do is just go through this example that we had from last time, from the last lecture, where we were looking at um, the Buckingham Pi theorem and the method of repeating variables, and we were using the ballistic equation. This is kind of the equation of like a ball being thrown up in the air and coming back down under the action of gravity. And uh, we were using that as our example, and we said that we were going to pretend we didn't know that equation existed. And instead, we just said that we knew that the position of the ball was a function of time, gravity, initial speed, and initial position. We, we just know from experience that's the case. And then we did a, di a dimensional analysis and ended up with these three pi terms. We have a dimensionless position, a dimensionless time, and a dimensionless initial velocity. So this came after our dimensional analysis. So what I want to do is just show you how we can do scaling from these pi groups. Okay. And the idea here is I'm going to I'm going to do an experiment on Earth. So so my goal here is I want to predict what's going to happen on the moon, okay? Let's say we're going to build a spacecraft. We're smart enough to know how to build a spacecraft and get it from the Earth to the moon, but we still don't know about the existence of the ballistic equation. We we just we don't know that. But I want to predict what's going to happen on the moon if I drop a ball from a particular height. I want to be able to predict where it's going to be as a function of time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run some experiments on the Earth. And from those experiments, I'm going to scale the results to what's going to happen on the moon. And we're going to use dimensional analysis to do that. So we're going to perform these experiments on the Earth, where gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the position of the, the vertical position of the ball as a function of time. And I'm going to do this uh, for fixed initial height of one meter and three different initial speeds of 10 meters per second, 20 meters per second, 30 meters per second. And the reason I'm doing it like that is because what I'm going to do is I'm going to first actually get, you know, uh, y as a function of time, gravity, initial position, and uh, initial speed. But then I'm going to convert it into dimensionless form here so that I have the pi terms. And the whole idea here is, let me put pi one here, pi two there. Pi three. I'm gonna I'm gonna calculate what the pi terms are for the Earth, and then I'm going to just keep those pi terms constant for the Moon, where the gravity is different, 
and then be able to, since I know the pi 2 and the pi 3 are the same between the Earth and the Moon, then I know that the pi 1 that I calculated for the Earth will be the same one on the Moon, and then I can do some scaling to figure out what the position is going to be on the Moon. Okay, so let me just continue with the example. So what I've done is I've made a spreadsheet where I've kind of collected my data. And I didn't really do the experiment. I know what the exact trajectory of the ball is going to be. So what I did is I cheated. I used that equation to figure out what the ball would be for different times and different velocities and in different positions. Um, and, uh, but, but pretend I did the experiment. Okay, so I said here's the gravity on the Earth, the initial position. Here are my three different velocities, 10 meters per second, 20 meters per second, 30 meters per second. And then I threw the ball up in the air with those initial speeds from that initial height, and I measured its position as a function of time. So here's position as a function of time for that speed, position versus time for that speed, position versus time for that speed. Okay, so pretend we run that experiment and that's the data that we get. So now what I want to do because is convert this to dimensionless form. The data that's in the spreadsheet right now is it dimensional. You can see we have like meters and seconds and meters per second. Now let me just convert it into the pi terms. These are the pi terms right up at the top of your screen here. So I'm going to convert that data over. And so I kind of I give an example of how we do that. So just this, this is just a reminder of what our expression looks like in terms of pi terms. So for example, at an initial speed of 10 meters per second, our gravity is 9.81, our initial position is 1 meter. This pi 3 term right there just comes out to be 3.19. At that time, that acceleration in that initial position, here's our second pi term, the dimensionless time. And then we make our measurement of the position given that initial location. And there's our pi 1 term on, on this side of the equation. So what I've done is I've just taken that, that data from up here and I just converted it into these dimensionless quantities. So this particular calculation, for example, um, corresponds to this particular case. Right, so you can see this, this value, this value and that value correspond to this and this. So I just, I just did the calculation just to show you by hand which data point I'm, I'm working with here. But you can do the same idea for all the rest of these. right? So this is all of that same data, but just presented in a dimensionless form. Okay, So all I've done is just make it dimensionless. And we'll plot it. Okay, So we'll plot the uh, dimensionless position as a function of dimensionless time for our three different dimensionless speeds. And this is what we get. So you can see the vertical axis is dimensionless position, the y over y naught, that's this one right up here. Let me highlight this in a different color so we can refer to it more easily. So the y over y naught is this. The dimensionless time here is this one down here. And then the three different colors, like the gray and the orange and the blue, correspond to the different dimensionless speeds. So let me give that one a different color as well. Uh, we'll do that one in blue. So these speeds are these up here. Okay, so that's our data plotted now. And I didn't draw the lines in here, but you can kind of get a feel for, you know, what the curves look like. So that's our, our experimental data in dimensionless form plotted out. Okay, so this is data that I gathered here on Earth, right? Because the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. But I said at the beginning of this example, what we really want to do is predict what's going to happen on the moon. So I'm running the experiment on the Earth, but I'm going to use uh, this data from the Earth and scale it so we can predict what's going to happen on the moon. So let's go now a little bit further. So let's now evaluate what would happen on the moon where the gravity is about one-sixth that of Earth, so it's... Uh, 1.63 meters per second squared. And let's say that we're just arbitrarily interested in wanting to know for that gravity where the ball would be if I released it at a speed of 10 meters per second from a height of 1 meter at 4 seconds. And I just want to, where's the ball going to be for those conditions? I just arbitrarily pick those values. Okay. So how can I use my Earth data to predict what's going to happen on the moon where the gravity is different. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create, I'm going to, I'm going to make the same pi 2 and pi 3 terms, right? So remember that our equation looked like this. y over y naught was a function of these two pi terms. I mean, these, yeah, uh, these pi terms on the right-hand side. So here's our pi 1, pi 2, pi 3. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, form the pi terms on the right-hand side for these conditions on the moon. So I'm going to do my, here's my, my pi 2 term. Remember, the gravity is a little different now. I'm using the 1.63, so I get a different, so I get some value of, you know, 5.11 for these conditions. And here's my pi 3 term. Again, gravity is a little different. I get that value. So now if I come back down to my plot, here's my, let me just highlight again so it's easy to refer. So here's the 5.11 down here. That's going to be right at this point. Okay, because this is my pi 2 term. And then my pi 3 term is this one over here. So that's 7.83. That, that has to, that's kind of somewhere in between those two. So it'll be a line kind of going like this. This is the, the value for y dot naught over square root of g y naught equals 7.83. That's that line. And I'm kind of interpolating here because I, I did, didn't do that. Um, when I did my experiment on Earth, I, I didn't do that number exactly. I had 3.19, 6.39, and 9.58. So it's somewhere in between those curves. So I'm kind of estimating. So then I'll see where those two intersect. And of course, it intersects right there. And then I'll go over and read off my pi 1 term right here. So this is my pi 1 term. Okay, so, and my pi 1 term gives me a value of, it's down here, of 27.7. So you can see it's 27.7 here. And since I know that my y naught term was 1 meter, I can convert, I can calculate very quickly what my y value would be. So this would be the expected position of that ball on the moon. Okay, at, at, for these conditions, for that gravity, that time, initial speed, and initial position, the ball should be at 27.7 meters, you know, to the best of my estimation based on this kind of course plot here. All right, so that's the, that's the expectation. And if you, since we know what the real equation is, it's just the ballistic equation, I can just plug in the real values and what it comes out to be in reality is about 28 meters. So, man, I'm awfully close. So what I've done is I've actually, let's think about this for a second. What I actually did is I ran an experiment on the Earth where the gravity is different. I collected the data in dimensional form. I made it dimensionless, plotted it out. Then I said, okay, on the moon, I'm interested in this particular case. The gravity is different, um, but let me calculate my pi terms. And then I used my pi terms from, from the moon um, and the data presented in terms of pi terms on the Earth, and then I was able to, to figure out what the pi 1 value would be for the moon, and then back out what the actual dimensional value was for the moon, and it, it works. It, it, you can see you know, the result here, 27.7 and 28, uh, it works. It's off a little bit because I made a, you know, an approximation from my plot here. It's kind of you know, round off error because of my estimation. So we're able to predict what's going to happen on the moon without ever going there and performing an experiment. All we did was this. We, we took a look at these pi terms. So what we did is we, did, we, we plotted this function. What, what this function is, is just these lines. Let me draw the lines again. So these lines are our function, okay? We just, we're just finding what the function looks like experimentally. And then we, we found those, that function on Earth by, by plotting different values for pi 2 and pi 3 on the Earth to figure out what you know, the pi 1 looks like or the function looks like. And then all I did is I said, okay, on the moon, for a particular pi 2 and pi 3 value, I just came back over to the plot and pulled off the pi 1 value from it. 
it, you have to think about it for a little bit for it to all make sense, okay? I, but um, this is how we do scale modeling is the key is to keep the pi terms the same between the model and the prototype. If you can keep the pi terms the same, to keep them all the same, then you're guaranteed that you're going to get the same behavior between the model and the prototype. And so you can do scale modeling that way. So, if, for example, if we have that uh, jet aircraft in the wind tunnel, so scale model down there, there'll be certain pi terms that are important in that problem. That comes from our dimensional analysis and the method of repeating variables. We'll figure out what those pi terms are. And if we keep those pi terms the same in the model as in the full scale, you know, big aircraft in the atmosphere, if we keep those keep those pi terms the same between the prototype and the model, then they'll have the same behavior. And then we can do scaling just directly from the pi terms like what I did in this example. So that's how it all works. Okay, um, it'll be easier to see through some additional examples. So if you go and look through the, the PDF copies and videos I make um, that, that go along with this lecture in the examples, it'll be a lot clearer how it all works. Before I go, uh, there's one last thing I'll mention is that in many fluid mechanics problems, the important pi terms typically involve, of course, geometric similarity. You've got to get all the length ratios the same. That's, that's pretty critical in general. Um, but what the pi term, the, the dynamic similarity pi term that shows up over and over again is usually the Reynolds number. So in a lot of fluid mechanics scenarios, the things that you have to really keep the same between the prototype in the model, you need to keep the geometric similarity the same. Uh, certainly just kind of the gross, you know, kind of large scale um, dimensions of it this, um, need to scale in the same way. And then for dynamic similarity, it's usually the Reynolds number that's important. Now there may be other uh, force ratios that are important, but Reynolds number shows up over and over again as being an important uh, dynamic similarity variable. And you'll see that in the next lecture when we talk about making the Navier-Stokes equations dimensionless. You'll see how that shows up naturally from that. Um, all right, I think that's everything I wanted to say in this example. Um, so we'll go ahead and end it there.